I will be discussing prostate cancer grading from Gleason to Genitor Your Neuropathology Society or the GUPS current recommendations. Gleason uh, grading was begun uh, in 1967, continued to 1973. Not much was done in terms of uh, changing Gleason grading until it ISUP International Society of Urological Pathology Consensus Conferences in 2005 and 2014, uh, both of which uh, I was fortunate to have led. In 2014, uh, in comparison uh, the original Gleason diagram to uh, where we were after 2014, you can see that for Gleason pattern three, where the biggest changes were made, Gleason allowed various cribriform patterns and poorly formed glands within Gleason pattern three. And after the 2014 consensus conference, what we see here is that now Gleason pattern three is a very uniform population of glands uh, without any cribriform glands or poorly formed glands. So again, a very simple definition for Gleason pattern three, individual well-formed discrete glands. Here we can see an example where you can mentally draw circles around these glands and all of these glands have well-formed lumina. I typically grade at 10x using the 10x objective, uh, but occasionally at 10x, so one will see an area where the glands are very crowded, where it may be difficult to tell, are these still discrete glands or potentially are they fused glands? So if one goes to higher magnification, one can see that these glands still are individual and discrete, although in some areas almost back to back, still consistent with Gleason pattern three. The biggest problem in grading Gleason pattern three, and one of the biggest problems in general with grading prostate cancer, is in the case where it's Gleason pattern three, and then one sees a few apparently poorly formed glands. And the question is, are these true poorly formed glands of Gleason pattern four, or could they just be tangential sections or uh, outpouchings off of small well-formed glands of Gleason pattern three? My approach is if there's only a, two or three of them that are surrounded by well-formed glands, uh, including many that are smaller, uh, I would not call this Gleason pattern four. So my personal preference is in practice, if it is borderline between a lower and higher grade cancer, I assign the lower grade so as not to uh, overgrade and potentially lead to overtreatment of a patient. The other thing I find helpful is to do levels to clarify. So here's a case that uh, there were just tiny cluster, just a few of what could be poorly formed glands, but on the other hand, potentially could have been a tangential section off of the tops of some of these smaller glands. So we did levels, or I looked at the levels, and when you look at the levels, you can see that these glands now open up. So this would be now a case of Gleason pattern three. So I do find levels very helpful in some of these borderline cases. In terms of Gleason pattern four, uh, basically in Gleason's error, they were for the most part irregular cribriform glands. What we now see is that uh, there's any number, uh, any cribriform glands uh, in pattern four, as well as fused glands and poorly formed glands. So one of the biggest uh, uh, things to come out of the consensus conference in 2014 was that all cribriform cancer glands are graded as Gleason pattern four. So here we see small, well-circumscribed, uniform cribriform glands in the past. Uh, this would have often been called uh, cribriform Gleason pattern three. It is now called uh, Gleason pattern four. Here we see more irregular cribriform glands, alumina are not as well formed, but still they're definitely present, uh, Gleason pattern four. And glomeruloid glands, which after the 2005 consensus conference were controversial how to grade them. 2014, based on some data that we had done and others and the morphology, it was decided that glomeruloid glands are cribriform glands, you can see quite clearly, they're just not transluminal cribriform. They basically poke into a dilated gland, uh, some are large, some are small, wide range of size, and they superficially resemble a glomerulus. But, but because they are cribriform glands, they tend to occur in concert with other cribriform patterns, as you can see here, uh, they are considered Gleason pattern four. A pitfall is that one can see telescoping in Gleason pattern three, where we have well-formed glands, telescoping within well-formed glands, 
uh, this is not glomeruloid, these are not cribriform, these are Gleason pattern three. Fuse glands are relatively less common than poorly formed glands and cribriform glands. And you have to be careful, you don't want to call fuse glands in just a couple of fuse glands, which could be a tangential section off of a cylinder uh, of a, a Gleason pattern three uh, tubule, but rather to call pattern four on fuse glands, you want to see multiple fuse glands as we see here. And here we see example where we have some well-formed glands of pattern three. Again, you can draw little circles mentally around them. They're discrete individual glands. But what we can also see are clusters of poorly formed glands. Uh, and this is what you need to call pattern four, to see a cluster of these poorly formed glands that you know cannot be an artifact of tangential sectioning. And then we come to Gleason pattern five, which is really the only pattern that hasn't changed uh, from Gleason's original uh, work in the 60s and 70s uh, to current practice, where there's a lack of uh, glandular differentiation. Now, you'll notice I've not mentioned at all Gleason patterns one and two. And that is because currently, and I'll explain a little bit later, uh, based on grade group uh, that I've de we developed here at Hopkins, um, we, don't, we no longer use Gleason patterns one and two. If the definition of Gleason pattern three are individual well-formed discrete glands, that's the same that you see in patterns one and two. So we lump together one, two, and three. We don't use patterns one and two. If something looks like in the old days, you might've called it pattern one and two, you would call it pattern three today. In terms of Gleason pattern five, uh, the one variant of Gleason pattern five that is uh, most reproducible amongst pathologists are sheets of cells, as we see here, without any glandular differentiation. More problematically for pathologists is calling Gleason pattern five in the presence of single cells. Uh, what you need to call Gleason pattern five are numerous single cells or a cluster of single cells that you can be comfortable cannot be a tangential section off of a poorly formed gland of Gleason pattern four. So this would warrant the diagnosis right here on this photomicrograph of Gleason pattern five. Sometimes one sees a sheet of cells where there's no true glandular formation. There's no true punched out holes of cribriform glands. It's just a vague attempt with this cytoplasm almost in a pseudo rosette formation um, at trying to barely attempt to make some kind of a glandular differentiation, but not sufficient enough to warrant Gleason pattern four. So when you see these rosette formations in an otherwise solid sheet of cells, that is still Gleason pattern five. In order to use necrosis to change the grade up to a Gleason pattern five, the typical scenario where that is seen is when you have a cribriform gland with necrosis, where if you didn't have the necrosis, it would be classified as Gleason pattern four. Now you have to be careful. You can often see secretions and kind of uh, serum within glandular lumen uh, that is not necrosis. What you need to see is good karyorectic debris and individual dying cells coming off the, the lumen to call the necrosis to warrant calling a Gleason pattern five. Turns out that many of the cases that we call, uh, or in the past we might have called Gleason pattern five based on necrosis, are actually intraductal carcinoma uh, if one does basal cell states. If one has well-formed individual glands that would be Gleason pattern three, and you see some necrotic cells within them, that's not Gleason pattern five, that's still Gleason pattern three. You're not seeing dead cells along the lining uh, of these areas. What we've written a, a, a couple of articles on and what I routinely see in my daily practice is that pathologists uh, typically undergrade, in my experience, a Gleason pattern five. Um, I think pathologists are very uncomfortable giving patients the worst possible grade, even though when it's present, it's important for both treatment and prognostic purposes. Now, so far I've shown you the schematic diagrams uh, of Gleason grading. Uh, I think we can do better than that. We have cameras on our microscope. We can take photomicrographs. So I've come up with a photo montage uh, showing the various patterns of uh, Gleason uh, grading. Uh, as you can see, I've lumped patterns one through three together, as I've discussed. We don't distinguish between them. 
then pattern four, and then pattern five. So there's really only three patterns that one needs to be aware of for grading prostate cancer. Uh, if anyone's interested, I'll be glad to uh, email them uh, uh, a higher resolution image of this uh, photo montage. So now let's talk about variants of prostate cancer and their grading. So it's pretty simple in that you apply the same rule as you would grade usual prostate cancer based on the underlying grade pattern with the exception of small cell carcinoma that I'll talk about shortly. So just like with usual prostate cancer, if you see individual well-formed glands, that's pattern three. If you see cribriformed glands, that's pattern four. And if you see individual cells or necrosis, that's Gleason pattern five. That applies to foamy gland cancer, where most of the time it's well-formed glands, Gleason pattern three. You can see cribriform foamy gland cancer, Gleason pattern four, individual cells of foamy gland cancer, Gleason pattern five. Pseudohyperplastic cancer are large are cancers that have individual well-formed glands. They're just branching larger glands, but still they are individual glands, so they're pattern three. Colloid or mucinous adenocarcinoma, uh, typically cribriform glands in mucin pattern four, but you can see individual well-formed glands in mucin pattern three. Signet ring cell-like adenocarcinoma with clear vacuoles, typically patterns four and five, but occasionally you can see well-formed glands with vacuoles and that would be pattern three. Then we come to ductal adenocarcinoma. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in depth since it's one of the more common patterns of, uh, or variants of prostatic adenocarcinoma. So the classic patterns of prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma are cribriform and papillary. It's defined as uh, tumors with tall pseudostratified columnar epithelium, as opposed to the simple cuboidal epithelium and round nuclei that we get with usual or acinar prostate cancer. Now, cribriform prostatic ductal cancer, again, applying the same rules that we do for usual cancer would be obviously pattern four. Papillary prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma with papillary fronds lined by pseudostratified columnar epithelium doesn't, with rare exception, have an analogy with usual prostate cancer. So we can't really apply the same rules. But it turns out that papillary prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma typically coexists with cribriform prostate cancer and prognostically appears to be equally aggressive. So cribriform and papillary prostatic ductal adenocarcinomas are at least in pattern four. And if it's pure, we call it a four plus four equal eight. Pin-like ductal adenocarcinoma is a relatively new variant where there are individual well-formed discrete glands with well-formed lumina, but the glands, instead of being lined by cuboidal uh, epithelium and round nuclei, like usual prostate cancer, are lined by pseudostratified columnar epithelium characteristic of ductal cancer. Um, these are called either pin-like ductal adenocarcinoma, some people call them pin-like adenocarcinoma. But because they're individual well-formed glands, discrete glands, we call them pattern three. If it's pure, three plus three equals six, and they have a favorable prognosis. Ductal adenocarcinoma, if there's necrosis, would be warranted at least in pattern five, again, applying the same rules that we do with usual prostate cancer. Now, it's not uncommon to sometimes see mixed patterns or variants and the usual prostate cancer. And so basically you grade the variant, you grade the usual prostate cancer, you put it all together and grade it just like you normally would. So for example, if you had a needle biopsy core that was 60% uh, cribriform ductal adenocarcinoma, 40% usual Gleason pattern three adenocarcinoma, you would call that core a four plus three equal uh, seven uh, with you know, prominent ductal features. Now coming to small cell carcinoma. Small cell carcinoma is a variant of prostate cancer that lacks glandular differentiation, but we don't call it Gleason pattern five. It has unique histology, immunohistochemistry, and most important clinically and treatment and prognostic implications that differs from what you would do with the usual Gleason pattern five prostate cancer. So it's a, if we see small cell carcinoma, we don't assign a Gleason grade. Now if you see small cell cancer and usual prostate cancer coexisting, which is not uncommon, you grade the usual prostate cancer, you note the small cell cancer, but again, don't grade the small cell carcinoma. One can also see cancer following radiation therapy or hormone therapy. Uh, if you see histological 
ordinary prostate cancer following hormone or radiation therapy. It looks like non-treated cancer, meaning that if you just look under the microscope, you'd never get a clue that this patient had been treated with radiation or hormone therapy. You see this cancer without significant treatment effect, you give it a Gleason grade, uh, and that's a poor prognostic uh, finding. Uh, the patient's recurred. On the other hand, if you see cancer, yet it shows treatment effect, you say this cancer with significant treatment effect, you do not give it a Gleason grade. And I'll go into this uh, in greater extent when I cover my lecture on mimickers of prostate cancer. But here's a case of adenocarcinoma of the prostate with radiation effect. And what you see are architecturally, it's not normal. There are individual cells scattered amongst the stroma in a haphazard array. We see glands with abundant cytoplasm, typically vacuolated cytoplasm. That's characteristic of carcinoma with radiation effect. You also see, see individual cells, often with very bland looking nuclei. So if one were to grade this, you would call this a four plus five or five plus four equal nine prostate cancer. But this could have been even a three plus three equals six that has shown successful treatment with radiation uh, therapy. So consequently, if you see again, cancer with treatment effects, such as you're seeing here, you say this cancer with significant treatment effect and do not assign a Gleason grade. One can also see cancer that have been treated with cryotherapy, which is freezing the prostate, or HIFU, high intensity frequency ultrasound, which basically burns the prostate. And these are basically just mechanical destructions of the prostate, both benign and malignant. And when you see cryotherapy or HIFU, basically it causes infarction of both benign and malignant tissue. If you have successful therapy with these, with these uh, hypo or cryo, you basically get scarring, hemocytor and deposition. And if you do see tumor uh, that's dead, it's just going to look like ghosts of tumor, but the tumor will not have any other specific treatment effect. It's just infarcted tumor. If you see viable tumor that's not necrotic, it's going to look just like usual prostate cancer. In that case, you give it a grade, it indicates viable active tumor that needs further treatment, then you can do additional cryo and hypo in those areas. What I'm now going to turn to is reporting rules for Gleason grading. This is from the 2014 consensus conference. On a radical prostatectomy or a needle biopsy, you do not mention if the lower grade component is less than 5%. So on a core or radical prostatectomy nodule, which is 98% pattern four, 2% pattern three, you would grade it as a four plus four equal eight. So here we see schematically, there's a needle biopsy. It's almost all pattern four, just a little three. This is a, overall an aggressive tumor. It's a four plus four equal eight. If you have a needle biopsy with different cores showing different grades, one should assign individual Gleason scores to separate cores as long as the cores are submitted in separate containers or the cores are in the same container, yet specified by the urologist as to their location, for example, with different colored inks. If, however, the urologist, for example, puts three cores into a single jar, they don't differentially ink the core, and let's say each of those cores show cancer and they have different grades, because the urologist is indicating that Either those cores are coming from the same area, and that's, not, that's why they're not differentially inked, or he doesn't care or she doesn't care to note the different grade because, again, they're not differentially inked. Either way, basically, the way you approach it is in that setting, you take pretend all the positive cores are one long core, and you just give one grade for those three undesignated cores. In terms of reporting Gleason grade in a radical prostatectomy, each major tumor focus should be graded separately. It's very common in radical prostatectomies to see multifocal cancer, where you might have a tumor on the right, tumor on the left. So for example, if you had a tumor on the left that was in the peripheral zone, four plus four equal eight, and hypothetically you had on the right side, even a larger tumor, but it was a three plus three equals six. You assign each of those nodules a separate grade. You do not have, Put average them all together as a three plus four equals seven. 
the fact that there's a lower grade tumor somewhere else in the prostate does not mitigate the aggressiveness of this individual four plus four equal eight. And for the purposes of treatment and prognosis, this patient would be graded as a four plus four equal eight. Typically, we only grade the largest tumor foci. It's not uncommon to see multifocal uh, Gleason pattern three cancers scattered about um, in the setting of an otherwise dominant nodule. You don't have to note and report each one of those tiny foci. The exception is that sometimes you will see a smaller focus of high-grade cancer. Uh, and in those situations, you definitely want to include that in the report and grade it separately. I'd like to now turn to the Genital Urinary Pathology Society, or GUPS, white paper on contemporary grading of prostate cancer. Working group one dealt with percent Gleason pattern four, co-led by uh, Michelle Hirsch and Samson Fine. And the GUPS recommendations for reporting Gleason pattern four is to report the percentage of Gleason pattern four on needle biopsies with grade groups two to three, which is three plus four equals seven, and four plus three equals seven, and also report the percentage of Gleason pattern four in needle biopsy on parts with Gleason score seven, even if another part or parts in the case show Gleason score four plus four equal eight. Now let me go through several scenarios why it's important to report percentage of Gleason pattern four, given that it is extra work for the pathologist to, to report this. So you can have a case of three plus four equals seven, and let's assume this is the highest grade on a given uh, needle biopsy, uh, highest grade part. And you can have a three plus four equals seven with less than 10% pattern four. That patient may be a candidate for active surveillance uh, depending on other pathological parameters, for example, the extent of the cancer, other clinical parameters, patient age, comorbidity, patient preference. And there are many patients now who are actually are undergoing active surveillance, even though it's somewhat controversial, when they have a Gleason score seven. On the other hand, you could have a case where the highest grade in the part was a three plus four equals seven with close to 50% pattern four that patient would not be a candidate for active surveillance given their borderline between a three plus four and a four plus three. On the other hand, if you don't report percent pattern four and just grade each one of these cases as a three plus four equals seven, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between these two scenarios. Now the importance of reporting a percent Gleason pattern four of four plus three and four plus four ends up dealing with the use of adjuvant androgen deprivation therapy in patients being treated with radiation therapy. So typically, if you have a three plus four equals seven grade group two, most of those who are being treated with radiation therapy will not get adjuvant androgen deprivation therapy. On the other hand, four plus three equals seven grade group three may have androgen deprivation therapy. Four plus four equal eight grade group four typically will get androgen deprivation therapy, and they tend to get it for a longer period of time than those patients with four plus three equals seven who end up having androgen deprivation therapy. So depending on each one of these grades, if they're being treated with radiation, uh, can affect their uh, adjuvant androgen deprivation therapy, which has significant to morbidity. So it's not something uh, to take lightly. So here's a case, hypothetically, with the highest grade was a four plus three equals seven, 90% pattern four. So it's bordering a grade group three and grade group four. So if somebody was being treated with radiation, they would look at this case and say, it's a solid four plus three equals seven. Um, you know, definitely consider uh, androgen deprivation therapy. On the other hand, a four plus three equals seven with 60% pattern four is borderline between a four plus three and a three plus four, where a three plus four, you wouldn't get androgen deprivation therapy. So that patient typically would not be getting androgen deprivation therapy. Here we see a case where one core was a four plus four equal eight. The other cores were four plus three equals seven uh, with 90% pattern four. Someone, a radiation oncologist would look at this case and say, this is a solid four plus four equal eight. Um, even the four plus threes are bordering on a four plus four. Uh, this patient should get, in addition to radiation therapy, the more lengthy, extensive androgen deprivation therapy. On the other hand, a case of, uh, where there's one core with four plus four equal eight, other cores with four plus three, 60% pattern four. You could see a, a radiation oncologist saying, yes, there is one core with a four plus four, but 
the uh, majority of the cores are significantly less. Maybe overall, this case would be better treated as a solid four plus three, four plus three equals seven, or more aggressive four plus three equals seven. So let's give less androgen deprivation therapy. So what I've hoped I've shown you is the importance of giving a percent patent four for Gleason score seven is that it allows for more granular information, more detailed information on these cases, such that clinicians can give more individualized uh, care for the patient, more personalized medicine, a tailoring specifically each, for each individual case. And what you find when you talk to clinicians and go to conferences with clinicians is that for many of the scenarios such as I presented, uh, there is variability how clinicians will deal with these. It's not a formulaic. A and again, the more information you give them, I think the better uh, decisions they can make for their patients. What GUPS recommends in terms of reporting percentage of Gleason patent four is for the lowest interval, less than 5% or less than 10%, then 10% increments thereafter, 20, 30, 40, approaching 50%, the three plus four equals seven, 60, 70, 80, 90%, or four plus three equals seven. Working group two was tertiary grade patterns led by, uh, co-led by Fadi Brimo and John Chabot. And GAPS recommends a new terminology, minor tertiary pattern five to replace tertiary grade pattern. The key thing is not to use the term tertiary on a needle biopsy. So again, you just should never use that word on a needle biopsy. If you have a case with mostly three, a lesser amount of pattern four, and the least amount of pattern five, you grade as the most common plus the worst, that's a three plus five equal eight. Similarly, if you have mostly pattern four on a needle, lesser amount of three, least amount of five, it's a four plus five, most common plus worst. And the reason is any five on a needle biopsy is considered significant. You wouldn't want it to be lost in, in just a tertiary component note. Furthermore, any pattern five on a needle probably represents some more than just a minor amount of tumor in the prostate, uh, given it would be unlikely to hit that little bit of five on a needle. And also five is an aggressive, rapidly growing component, the more likely ha has more five in there that just wasn't sampled. So the key thing is it should be in the term minor tertiary pattern five, it should be tertiary, three patterns, and one of the patterns should be five. So in the radical prostatectomy, you only use it when there's three patterns, patterns three, four, and five. Again, we don't talk about patterns one and two. So in a radical prostatectomy, which is 98% Gleason pattern three, your nodule, your dominant nodule, and 2% pattern four, you would grade this, the GUPS would recommend grading this as a three plus four equals seven with 2% pattern four, not a three plus three equals six with a minor or tertiary pattern four. Similarly, if the dominant nodule showed 98% pattern four, 2% pattern five, again, there's no three patterns here. Uh, GUPS would recommend grading this as a four plus five equal nine, not four plus four equal eight with a minor tertiary pattern five. Now in that term, again, the key factor is it should be minor amount of pattern five. So the only time you use minor tertiary pattern five is in radical prostatectomies with three plus four or four plus three as the dominant nodules with less than 5% pattern five. Here we can see a nodule where you had 50% pattern three, 30% pattern four, and 20% pattern five. That's a not a minor amount of pattern five. That's a lot of pattern five. Uh, this is an aggressive tumor. Uh, so this should be called a three plus five equal eight. In terms of the effect of minor tertiary pattern five on gray group, minor tertiary pattern five is noted along with the Gleason score with a gray group based on the Gleason score. So you would say three plus four equals seven with minor tertiary pattern five, but the gray group still remains gray group two based on the score three plus four equals seven. It's not affected by the minor tertiary pattern five. Working group three was case level biopsy score, global versus highest. So with uh, Kirill Tripkoff and Jennifer Kordetsky as the co-leads. In terms of MRI targeted biopsy, when there are multiple undesignated cores taken from a single MRI targeted lesion, 
an overall grade for that lesion is given as if all the involved cores were one long cord. They're all just assembling one lesion. It should be one grade for that lesion, even if the cores are separate to have a different grade. Pretend again, they're all one uh, long core. If you are providing a global score, if there are different scores found in the standard and the MRI targeted biopsy, you give a single global score factoring in both the systematic standard and the MRI targeted positive cores. Where GUPS felt it required more data and a lack of compelling clinical rationale or prevailing practice patterns was whether to report a separate global Gleason score at the end of the report. Here we found in the survey of pathologists that there was geographical variation with 45% of non-United States pathologists reporting global scores versus only 16% of United States pathologists. So GUPS recommends it's optional to report a global score at the end of the case Global score is basically what you consider to be the overall score for that case, factoring in you know, various parameters. Now, it turns out that clinicians, even if you do provide a global score, typically use the highest Gleason score in a given part as the case level score. Furthermore, there is a lack of consensus amongst those who do use a global Gleason score at the end of the report as to the optimal method of how to derive the global score. Working group four was an update on grade groups uh, led by Isabella Warnick, Kuna, and myself. Grade groups is the recommended terminology. It was first proposed in 2013 by our group at Johns Hopkins. The concept of grade group was endorsed but not developed by multiple societies. And the grade group nomenclature has been accepted by multiple organizations and associations. GUPS recommends to retain Gleason scores 3 plus 5 and 5 plus 3 equal 8 as grade group 4. It should be noted it is a very rare event. In a large multi-institutional study, including genital urinary pathology experts, out of almost 21,000 radical prostatectomy specimens, there were only 0.2% of cases with 3 plus 5 equal 8 and only 0.02% with Gleason scores 5 plus 3 equal 8. And in the same study, out of over 16,000 needle biopsy cases, there were only 0.3% with a Gleason score 3 plus 5 equal 8, and only 0.04% with Gleason scores 5 plus 3 equal 8. This is the typical case that I would call a 5 plus 3 equal 8, for example, where one has individual cells of Gleason pattern 5, and then a very abrupt trans. Uh, uh, demarcation between that and uh, individual well-formed glands of the Gleason pattern three. What is the typical scenario is that when one does see individual cells of Gleason pattern five, it's almost always admixed with a significant component of poorly formed glands of Gleason pattern four, such that even if you do see some well-formed glands in that case, most cases with individual cells of Gleason pattern five would be graded as a four plus five or five plus four. The few studies that have been performed have demonstrated that Gleason score 3 plus 5 equal 8 has a similar prognosis to Gleason score 4 plus 4 equal 8. However, it is less clear at this point, in large part due to its rarity, whether Gleason score 5 plus 3 equal 8 should be more appropriately categorized as grade group 4 or 5. However, by keeping the Gleason score along with the grade group, which is what is currently recommended, clinicians can subcategorize Gleason score 8 prostate cancer with or without Gleason pattern five, if for example, they're stratifying patients into randomized clinical trials. Working group five dealt with cribriform carcinoma led by uh, Eva Compara and Christina Maggi-Galuzzi. The vast majority of studies on prostate cancer with cribriform architecture, whether inclusive of intraductal cancer or not, demonstrate associations between these prostate cancers and both adverse clinical outcomes and molecular features typically seen in advanced disease. Based on these findings, this is a novel recommendation, GUPS recommends reporting the presence or absence of cribriform glands in biopsy and radical prostatectomy specimens with Gleason pattern four cancer. You only have to do it once at the end of the case. Now, having said that, one should be aware that there are some significant issues with some of the studies on cribriform glands. There are different definitions as to what constitutes the adverse morphology 
in cases uh, that have been reported with cribriform glands? Is it only the large cribriform glands that have the adverse prognosis versus small glands versus any cribriform glands? Furthermore, the studies which have said that large cribriform glands have an adverse prognosis, there have been different definitions as to what constitutes a large cribriform gland used in these studies. Also, another weakness is that many of the studies showing an adverse prognosis with cribriform glands have been based on non-contemporary patient populations, which have been sampled by sextant or six core biopsies that may not be applicable to current contemporary practice. Also, many of the studies have not distinguished between intraductal cribriform cancer and cribriform invasive cancer. We know that intraductal carcinoma in many studies is associated with aggressive tumor. So in these studies where they, where they have not differentiated between the two, we don't know if the poor prognosis is due to the intraductal cancer or to the invasive cribriform cancer. They haven't been teased out. And here we can see some of the spectrum of cribriform glands. We have a small, large uh, glomeruloid. Those are all cribriform. Here we see a large cribriform. Here we see literally a case where there's only one cribriform gland with a single bridge going across. It's cribriform. Um, that would be also considered cribriform. Again, uh, anywhere from some glomeruloid to kind of irregular cribriform glands. Here we see irregular cribriform glands. And here we see small, medium-sized cribriform glands. Currently, all of those you would just call cribriform. Working group six dealt with introductal cancer, co-led by Brian Robinson and Ming Zhao. GUPS recommends reporting the presence of introductal cancer in biopsy and radical prostatectomy specimens. One should utilize the criteria by Guo and Epstein uh, based on dense cribriform glands and or solid mass and or marked pleomorphism uh, or the presence of necrosis. And I'll illustrate that in the next couple of slides. Dense cribriform glands are defined as over 50% of the gland composed of epithelium relative to luminal spaces. And in cases where the ratio is approximately equal, it's prudent to be conservative and diagnose the lesion as not meeting the full criteria for introductal cancer of the prostate. And GUPS recommends in those situations using the terminology, a typical introductal proliferation or AIP. When introductal cancer is identified on prostate biopsy in the absence of concomitant invasive adenocarcinoma, the pathologist should add a comment stating that typically introductal cancer is usually associated with high-grade prostate cancer. Here we see introductal cancer with dense cribriform glands where there's more epithelium relative to the lumina and surrounded by basal cells. Here we see a case on the top, introductal cancer with comedian necrosis, again, basal cells present. And on the bottom of case of introductal carcinoma with marked cytologic atypia, much more than what one would see with high-grade PIN, again, with an intact basal cell layer. GUPS recommends performing immunohistochemistry for basal cell markers when the biopsy shows Gleason score six cancer and cribriform glands that include a differential diagnosis of introductal cancer versus Gleason pattern four. It is not necessary to perform basal cell immunohistochemistry on needle biopsy and radical prostatectomy specimens. To identify introductal cancer, if the results of the stains are not going to change the overall highest Gleason score or grade group for the case. Let me emphasize, this is the vast majority of cases. The vast majority of times when you see some cribriform glands and you're not sure are those cribriform glands introductal cancer or maybe it's infiltrating cribriform cancer, most of those cases have overt invasive high-grade cancer elsewhere, leading to an overall high grade for the case, regardless of those other equivocal cribriform glands. And in that scenario, I wouldn't do special stains, just grade those equivocal cribriform glands as invasive cribriform cancer. It's not going to change the case. It's not worth doing stains on multiple parts. There are a minority of cases where you might have to do basal cell stains, even on multiple parts, uh, if the issue of whether those cribriform glands are introductal cancer or invasive cribriform cancer, and knowing that difference would change the overall uh, grade for the case. But again, that's a minority of cases. GUPS recommends not to include introductal cancer in determining the final Gleason score on the biopsy and or radical prostatectomy. It's problematic to grade introductal cancer as Gleason pattern four or five cancer in a small subset of cases associated with only low grade, grade group one prostate cancer. 
with or there's no evidence of invasive cancer. And I'll illustrate some examples of that next. Intraductal cancer in this setting may represent a precursor lesion, not necessarily, again, representing uh, retrograde extension of high-grade cancer into ducts. And in this setting where intraductal cancer is a precursor lesion, uh, patients have a significantly better prognosis than intraductal cancer associated with high-grade invasive cancer. For example, take a case of a four plus three equals seven, grade group three, and this intraductal cancer showing comedonecrosis. If you included the intraductal prostate cancer with the grade, you would grade it as a four plus five equal nine, grade group five. However, there's no data to support this marked increase of grade in this setting. There are cases that have been reported in series, uh, again, uh, some of them by us, uh, some by others, uh, where you have intraductal cancer and a radical prostatectomy only, no invasive cancer, prostate serially sectioned, totally submitted, basal cell stains done in every section with these cribriform glands. And this patient's 100% cured. Um, there's no invasive cancer, just like in any other organ system. Um, now, if you were to grade this case, you would call it a four plus five equal nine, and this patient may get adjuvant therapy and would be uh, given a horrible prognosis. Here's a case in a radical, again, totally embedded, uh, stains done on every block with tumor, where there was extensive introductal cancer with necrosis, and only a small focus uh, that there was Gleason pattern three. So again, if you were to grade the introductal cancer, you would call this a four plus five equal nine, same thing, horrible prognosis, maybe extra adjuvant therapy. That would have been incorrect. The prognosis is based on the only the invasive cancer, and that's a three plus three, and this patient should have a much more favorable prognosis. So in summary, there are controversies and uncertainty that persist in prostate cancer grading. The first prostate cancer grading recommendations from the Genital Urinary Pathology Society, GUPS, addresses these areas. And these recommendations on contemporary prostate cancer grading will be the basis of more standardized reporting while stimulating new uh, avenues for research. With that, I'll end. And I'm sorry that uh, I'm not able to be able to do this lecture in person. Uh, hopefully in better times, I'll be able to uh, do so. Again, uh, thank you so much.